All right, this is the third video in our Buffett series uh, that I'm doing with Tyler Crow. We are going to talk about Occidental Petroleum today. We saved Buffett's biggest stake of the three in terms of the percentage of the company he owns uh, for last. Um, before we dive in, please take a minute and check out the link you see on your screen, fool.com slash Frankel. You get the top 10 stocks to buy right now from The Motley Fool, and it is the best way to support this work we are doing on YouTube. Again, fool.com slash Frankel. So... Occidental Petroleum, let me just kind of run through the, the state of Berkshire's investment and what we know and all that before I kick it over to Tyler, because he is the the, the uh, energy expert out of the two of us, not even close. Um, he, he tried to talk me out of some bad energy investments back in the day. I didn't listen to him, and here we are. Um, so Berkshire owns a little over 255 million shares of Occidental Petroleum. That's a little over 27% of the company. Uh, about a $13 billion stake in a $46 billion market cap business. And this is not an investment that Berkshire acquired a big part of it all at once, kind of like he did with Bank of America, which we talked about er earlier, where you know 70% of the investment came from one move. Um, this is a stake that he's really built up over time. Um, over the past few years, has been consistently adding to it. Um, the stock is right now near its 52-week low, presumably, presumably because of low oil prices, but Tyler is going to get into some more details about that. It's actually the lowest it's been trading at since March, 2022. Um, so Occidental is an integrated oil company, um, but they specialize in, you know, they're more focused in upstream operations. And I know that to someone who doesn't know energy like me, that sounds like I'm speaking a different language. So that, now I'm going to kick it over to Tyler. What does Occidental actually do and um, and wh why do you think the stock's beaten down? Sure. I actually want to call uh, Occidental is a integrated in name only sort of business because um, if you actually look at the portfolio, it is overwhelmingly a uh, production company relative to the other parts of its business. Uh, when you when you hear the word integrated, it's basically uh, a, a, it, I wouldn't call it antiquated term, but it's a term that means that a company has production, uh, transportation, and logistics uh, assets as well as what are called downstream assets. So basically retail and refining. Um, the it, Occidental is considered an integrated in a sense because it does have some chemical manufacturing as well as some, some logistics pipelines to do it. But the logistics pipeline is more to serve its own assets rather than like, you know, taking in uh, from other assets and charging or from other producers and charging fees and things like that. And then the chemical company is, is a, is a pretty modest size relative to the rest of the bill, uh, rest of the business. I, I think when people think Occidental Petroleum, it is largely because of its oil and gas production, mostly in uh, the United States, specifically the Permian bases of Texas. It has some assets in Algeria and Oman and the, and, and the United Arab Emirates. Those are kind of like a, they've just been kind of sitting idle for a long time, very low decline businesses that just kind of like a cash engine. They don't have to invest a lot to get uh, returns on those. The, the money has been mostly in terms of investment lately has been in the United States, specifically in the Permian Basin because of shale production. It's been a uh, uh, a, a good returning business that tends to return, uh, uh, make returns quickly, which is something that's kind of novel and new for the oil and gas industry. You know, up until before shale, it would take years, maybe decades for your oil production to actually, you know, make returns for you, especially in like, I don't know, let's use the Gulf of Mexico, for example, you got to build a platform, do all your drilling, things like that can take a long time. Shale, I mean, I can, I can go drill a well in three weeks now and have it producing and, and generating returns. So it's it's kind of like there's more asset turnover, I guess is that the right word to use. I, I don't know if it's the best one, but specifically, uh, I think, you know, uh, like you said, uh, similar to Bank of America, where he kind of went in at a time of distress to help out a company, that was kind of how he got involved with Occidental Petroleum. Occidental made a very, very large acquisition of a company called Anadarko Petroleum in 2019. And what ended up happening was, is it got a bidding war with Chevron, probably spent a little bit more than it wanted to, and had to actually get alternative financing for it, specifically in the form of preferred shares and warrants from uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Um, and it also just happened to come like months before the COVID pandemic and 
demand fell through the floor. And so that, it, you know, it was kind of a very opportune time for, for, uh, Berkshire Hathaway to jump into it. He's been making open market purchases since then. So it's not like he just, like you said, it wasn't some big windfall. Um, as far as where Occidental is right now, it's a relatively, I, I'm going to call it a solid producer. It doesn't do anything that knocks your sock off, socks off in terms of production growth or anything like that. And it's basically a, it's a, it's a levered bet on where oil and gas prices are going to go. Um, I, there's some people that'll talk about its carbon capture business, but that is years down the road before any, any kind of returns that we actually see from that. And, you know, so I, I, one of the reasons I think it's been down lately and why people may be interested in looking at why it's so cheap is because like you said, oil prices are a little bit down and kind of similar to what happened with the Anadarko petroleum uh, acquisition in 2019. They made a recent acquisition now, Crown Rock. Uh, it is a much, much smaller acquisition uh, relative to it, but it happened just as oil prices are starting to climb. And part of the way to finance the Crown Rock acquisition was to do a, a divestment program. Uh, they wanted to invest $4.5 to $6 billion worth of assets over the next 12 to 18 months to kind of help, you know, shore up financing, uh, you know, allow it to focus on some of the, the better returning stuff. But selling oil and gas properties when oil is in the mid 60s is not nearly as lucrative as it was when it was closer to 80, I don't know, 90 days ago. And so there's, I, I think there's a little bit of a kind of a hangover of, yeah, oil, lower oil prices mean slightly lower returns. They're trying to sell assets at maybe not the most opportune time. But this is just kind of like table stakes of how it is in oil and gas. And so I, I, I don't know. I've, I've always kind of been a, meh with Occidental Petroleum. I think a lot of people look at it through rose-colored glasses simply because Berkshire Hathaway owns it relative to other oil and gas producers. I, I don't know. I've never been a huge fan of, of pure production companies like Occidental in the first place. So, you know, take my opinion with a, with a slight grain of salt, but I think that is the logic of why he's in it. Uh, he's also said he's a big fan of uh, management, specifically CEO Nikki Holub. So it, that's that covers why he's done it and maybe why the stock looks kind of interesting today. But I think it all kind of comes down to personal uh, uh, preferences when it comes to oil and gas. And I, I, I might not be the best person because I'm not a huge fan of that particular part of the oil and gas industry. Well, so l let me ask you one thing. Um, so. Oil recently dropped below the $70 a barrel level, and that's significant for a few reasons, in Occidental's case especially, because that's the level that they use for um, of certain assumptions they make when it comes to the acquisitions. You just mentioned their acquisition. Like with free cash flow estimates, they say uh, they use the $70 a barrel uh, price. Now, their CEO, you just met, also just mentioned, predicted an oil short supply shortage by the end of 2025. And to me, what little I know about energy, this kind of feels like a real estate agent telling you it's a good time to buy a house. Like it's really rare that you find a time when they don't say that there's going to be some sort of oil supply shortage in the in the next few years and all that. So how do you feel about that? How worried are you about the low prices right now? I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, like you said, I, I every single oil and gas uh, sort of investor call or anything like that that you listen to is going to talk about supply shortages, supply shortages, supply shortages, underinvestment. They've been talking about it for six years, I, I feel like, ever, or maybe even longer. Um, some of that is true, but if we kind of look at the global perspective right now, there's a lot of spare capacity being built up in OPEC. Um, there's kind of this idea that Venezuela may be changing a political regime, and that's the largest oil reserve in the world that's been a fraction of what it used to be. So I, look, it, one of the things about predicting oil prices is you're going to be wrong, regardless of what you say. I, I've been trying to, th I, I, I kind of think of it more as the health of the industry. And it, I think the industry is in a decent place now. I think they've sweated a lot of their assets to become much more profitable than they were in, say, in the mid 2010s. Uh, and uh, for the most part, I think that uh, Occidental and several others say that their break even, which means like we will make zero money is right around $40 a barrel. Um, so, and that's kind of like at the wellhead economics, which means specifically to drill a well, it doesn't get corporate cost or debt or anything like that. Um, 
or dividends. So I, I, I don't really know how to, I, I know I'm kind of going wishy-washy here, but I, I, I don't put a lot of credence in major supply shortages. I think I could, you could make the case for both at any given moment. And so, yeah, it, it tends to be when people are very bullish and want to buy oil stocks, they see supply shortages. And when people are bearish, they can see something else. I want to thank The Motley Fool for sponsoring this video. The Motley Fool is a company that provides investing insight and stock recommendations for investors of all skill sets and risk levels. You all know how much I love researching new stocks and trying to find the next best investment. So I'm proud to partner with The Motley Fool to bring you 10 stock picks from the popular product Stock Advisor. Stock Advisor has beaten the market by nearly five times. So go to fool.com slash Frankel to get your 10 stock picks now. The Motley Fool Stock Advisor returns are 767% as of July 5th, 2024, and are measured against the S&P 500 returns of 163% as of July 5th, 2024.